what is real, how do we know it's real, how does that help us fulfill our dreams, desires, intentions. Like go to the dictionary and you'll look at uh, the meaning of the word real um, and you'll find lots of descriptions but I think uh, one of the phrases that I liked when I looked at the dictionary of what is real was existence is real. That's pretty simple. Okay, so instead of getting into all kinds of abstract conundrums, which we will get into, um, let's say existence is real. A rock exists. Hand exists. Glasses exists. Sparkles exist. Clouds exist. Rainbows exist. We call this reality. This is our everyday experience of reality. That which exists. Let's not even go further than that definition. Let's say existence and reality are the same thing. You know that you exist. You know that that which you call your body exists. You can look at it. You also know that that which you call your mind exists. You experience it all the time. You're experiencing it right now as you're listening to me and you're interpreting what I'm saying and analyzing what you're saying. So your thoughts, your emotions, your imagination, your creativity, your insights, your uh, inspiration, your motivation, your uh, deepest intuitions, they exist. They exist as qualities of the mind. So we know that that which we call the body-mind exists. We also know that that which we call the world exists. You know, I'm looking out of my window right now, I see trees and clouds. I see my own body. I see a camera in front of me. I see a camera crew in front of me. So all of this exists. Our immediate experience of existence is that which we call matter. <clears throat> Once again, our immediate experience of existence is that which we call matter. Matter which we also call the physical world, which we also call physical existence, material existence. We use these words materialistic. These words are derived from the word matter. So when you go to a scientist and you say, what is matter made of? The very word material suggests that it is made of other material. Let's take a simpler example. Water. Water is a material entity. Right? We drink it. It's part of our circulation. In fact, most of our body is water. So what does water, what is water made of? A scientist would say it's made of a molecule that is a combination of two atoms, hydrogen and oxygen, H2O, two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen, H2O. Now this principle applies to complex entities, rocks, uh, biological entities, uh, plants, trees, it doesn't matter, anything that we call material. But we're taking the example of water because it's simple, right? Hydrogen is the simplest element in the universe and then there's helium and then uh, a little bit later down the periodic table we have oxygen. What are these uh, entities, hydrogen and, and oxygen made of? These atoms and the same principle applies to all the atoms. What are they made of? Well, they're made of particles. And any scientist will tell you that uh, when you get to the to the rock bottom of a rock, or you get to the smallest 
aspect of a rock, it's molecules and then atoms and then particles. Now, every school child learns that um, these particles are frequently referred to as electrons, protons, neutrons. Every atom in the periodic table is a combination of electrons, protons and neutrons, period. The electron has a minus charge, <clears throat> it's an activity in an atom. The proton has a positive charge, it's in the nucleus. And then uh, the neutron is also in the nucleus. It has a neutral charge, no, no charge at all. But of course, you know, scientists are curious people, so they say, what are electrons made of? It turns out all electrons are a negative charge, period. Well, what are protons made of? Now we get into complexities. Protons are made of quarks, which are held together by other smaller particles called gluons. And then, you know, if you go to the Hadron Collider in Europe, where they do experiments on particles, you end up um, knowing that particles are made of smaller particles, which are made of smaller particles, etc., etc. And ultimately, all particles have a dual character. They are both material objects, as in the fact that they have units of mass and energy. So any material object has a unit of mass and energy. We know from Einstein, E is equal to mc squared. So mass and energy are exactly the same. That's the basis of all our technology today. The fact that you can see me on your computer screen or wherever else is based on this technology, which is based on the understanding that matter is both energy and information. So this information that I'm imparting to you is uh, coming to you as energetic entities called photons, electrons, electromagnetic waves. But this information is not only energy, but there's information imbued in it. Information actually is coded in energy. So this energy is um, ultimately, if you trace it to its source, this energy is, um, depending, depending on the school of uh, science that you follow, but all schools of science will say that matter is made of molecules, is made of particles, is made of energy, is, has information in it. And as we go down this rabbit hole, what we end up with is what scientists today refer to as the quantum vacuum. So what is the quantum vacuum? Again, um, it's part of something called quantum field theories. The quantum vacuum is the source of all the energy and matter in the universe. All of it. All the source of energy and matter in the universe comes from the quantum vacuum, which is brimming with this activity that is referred to as virtual particles. In that, you can't see them, but through various technologies, you can be sure that they exist. They exist not as real particles, but as the potential for what we call real particles. Okay, so the quantum vacuum is the source of virtual energy and virtual particles that ultimately become real energy and real particles and these real particles ultimately end up being atoms, molecules, matter, rocks, trees, uh, clouds, rainbows, stars, galaxies, your own physical body, but also other biological organisms, rabbits, elephants, dolphins, whales, anything you can think of. Any entity you can think of as physical has its source in 
this quantum vacuum. Now, I've asked a lot of my physicist friends, friends, is this thing that we call quantum vacuum, which obviously is not how we usually think of matter and energy, is this in space and time? I asked my physicist friends, and you can go look up Wikipedia, or you can go look up Google, or any other source on the internet, and you can ask this question, you know, is the quantum vacuum in space-time? And you'll see that you'll get uh, lots of answers that are ambiguous. Some people say yes, some people say no, but the quantum vacuum cannot be seen. Okay, just know that the quantum vacuum is not something that you can know through your senses. It's a uh, hypothetical mathematical construct for the fact that the entire universe has a source in what we as normal human beings, even without a background of science, we would say the source is immaterial in the sense that is nothing that we can identify as a material object. It is an emptiness it's a void, it's the potential for energy, information, matter, and ultimately everything that we call physical, including your own body. Okay, so now let me summarize how we perceive reality according to the scientific method. How we perceive reality is that reality is made up of matter, molecules, atoms, particles, virtual particles, which exist in a domain that cannot be seen and is invisible and has the nature of potentiality. It is the source of information, energy, and the physical world. But by itself, it's a source of potential. It's a pot source of the material universe, but it exists as the potential for information and energy, which ultimately becomes everything physical. So I know I've repeated myself a few times, but you need to get this totally and completely at a gut level, intellectual level as well. As we go beyond the appearance of molecules, we enter a subatomic cloud, and when we go beyond the cloud, we end up with nothing. The essential nature of the physical world is that it's not physical. The essential nature of the material world is that uh, it's not uh, material. You know, my favorite uh, poet Rumi says, we come spinning out of nothingness scattering stars like dust. And this is you. Because you, as a physical body-mind, have your source in the same nothingness from everything comes, from which everything comes. Nothing is the source of everything. And so, what is the nature of this nothingness? Is it an empty void, or is it the womb of creation? Does nature go to the same place to create a galaxy of stars, a cluster of nebulas, a rainforest, a rabbit, a dolphin, a human body-mind, a thought. What is this nothingness from where we all come? This is what we are going to explore as we try and figure out the nature of fundamental reality. Conclusion, reality. The only permanent reality is made out of nothingness. Okay, and nothingness is the immeasurable potential of all that was, all that is, all that will ever be. Since it's a potential, it is not in space-time. Now, this is a very difficult concept for most people because all our experiences are in space-time. Right now, you're having an experience of yourself, of other people, of objects, 
of the world and this experience is happening in space and in time. Right now, you know, this experience is happening for you when you're watching it in time and then it's also happening in space because in order for objects to exist, the only way you can define an object is its material separate from other objects and what it is separated by is space. So, here's the first thing to realize. Fundamental reality is inconceivable or unimaginable unless you are trying to tackle it through mathematics. You know, in mathematics, people use formulas where they use uh, symbols, zero. Now, nobody can imagine zero. They also use other symbols, infinity. Can't imagine it because um, it's formless. Fundamental reality is without form. It has no edges in space. It does not exist in time. It is infinite possibilities. It is all of creation, past, present and future. It seems to be spontaneously generating what we call the universe, effortlessly. It seems to be evolving also as the evolution of species. It seems to be evolving as the appearance of the universe and it seems to be correlated with all that exists. What do I mean by that? Correlated like look at my body. I have a liver here, I have a spleen here, I have a heart here, I have lungs here, intestine, gonads, eyes. I think of these as separate organs. Of course they are, but at a more fundamental level, they are correlated activities. Everything that's happening in your body, everything is correlated or synchronized or in harmony with everything else. Okay, your stomach cell is not is focused on digesting food and supplying nutrients to your liver, which is supposed to be detoxing um, what is not necessary engaging in metabolism and then every other activity in your body, whether we call it hormonal activity, biochemical activity, brain activity, heart activity, it's all part of a symphony of correlations of activities. A human body can think thoughts, play a piano, kill germs, remove toxins and make a baby all at the same time. So I use the word non-local correlation for this symphony of events that is the whole universe. It's not just your body. Everything in the universe is correlated. The migration of birds or butterflies for that matter, the weather patterns, climate, ecology, this is all correlated at a fundamental level. And uh, many people even call this quantum entanglement when they refer to this correlation at a fundamental level. It's difficult to explain this at the macro level, but it's happening. It's happening in your body as well. So fundamental reality is infinitely correlated. Fundamental reality is invisible, immaterial. It's not in space-time, but it is the source of space-time. It doesn't have energy, information or matter. It's the potential for energy, information and matter. It is not in space-time. It is the source of space-time and matter, of course. It is infinitely creative and spontaneously creative. It's generating the universe. And not only is it generating the universe, that which we call the universe contains biological species that are evolving from bacteria to microbes to amoeba to rodents to amphibians to plants to mammals to primates and ultimately human beings. It all has its source in nothingness. And this nothingness is the immeasurable potential of all existence. It is more real 
than the existence that we experience on the level of matter. Why do I say that? Because everything I experience on the level of matter is shifting, transforming, has a beginning, has a middle, has an ending. Some things have a beginning that goes back a long time ago, such as rocks. The rocks were originated in the, uh, in the crucible of burning stars through nuclear fusion and other mechanisms, uh, the weak interactions, which are nuclear um, mechanisms. But everything that we experience in the physical world is transforming, it's changing, it has a beginning, it has a middle, it has an end. In other words, it has a shelf life. The shelf life of rocks is long. The shelf life of bi biological organisms is relatively shorter, although where I am right now, there are a lot of red uh, redwood uh, trees and they live a long time, thousands of years. The shelf life of a human being uh, could be in the 70s, 80s, 90s, up to 120 maybe, but uh, everything has a shelf life. And so if you're a biological organism, as a biological organism, you have a birth, and then you have a series of experiences that you call life, and then there's death. Okay, this is the physical world. But the source of the physical world is timeless, eternal, and it generates this appearance of matter, which when we analyze, we end up with smaller pieces of matter, with energy, with information, and the infinite void. So what is fundamental reality? I think I've said it many times, but let me summarize. It's infinite possibilities. It's not material. It's the potential for all that was, is, and will be. It's infinitely correlated or synchronistic. It's spontaneously creative and evolving. It is also self-regulating and self-evolving. And it manifests as that which we call physical matter. I have not talked about the mind at all right now, which I will. But I wanted to conclude the first session with just this simple understanding that you have your source in the nothingness that is everythingness. You have your source in... Um, a void of infinite potential and you're connected to that right now because if you weren't connected to that you wouldn't exist. Existence is both physical, material, visible and it's also existence is non-material, invisible, eternal, timeless. The physical existence is transient, changing, transforming, evolving, and ultimately impermanent. Some things are more impermanent than others. So particles moving at lightning speeds are relatively impermanent as compared to, say, rocks and stars, which are also impermanent but have a much longer life, and your body that falls somewhere between instantaneous creation and dissolution and then creation and dissolution that lasts billions of years and somewhere in the middle is your body and that which you call your mind. The last thing I wanted to say was this fundamental reality is imbued with unpredictability which means um, you can do experiments which will give you statistical likelihood of what you will see as particles, but you'll never be able to predict that with 100% accuracy. So some, some, some people say fundamental reality is unpredictable. Some others say it's random. I don't like the word random for something that's correlating the world and the universe with infinite correlation. So let's settle with the word unpredictable. Unpredictable means 
you and I, at the level of the mind, do not know what's going on. But at a fundamental level, what appears random is ultimately in appearing as the physical universe which you and I imbue with meaning and um, with some kind of purpose as human beings. We impart meaning and purpose to this. But I would like to add one more attribute to fundamental reality. It is the source of attention and intention. Because if you're not aware of a particular aspect of reality, then it doesn't exist. You're only aware of that which you put your attention on and imbue it with intention. What does it mean? Okay, that's enough for the first session. Thank you very much. Let's move to another way of uh, looking at that which we call existence or reality. Using the terms synonymously, existence, reality. So let's look at another way. So far, I have tried to explain everything in scientific terms, saying that the entire material world is a result of fluctuations in the quantum vacuum. Since we are talking about all existence, uh, including the existence of our body-mind, we can safely say that the scientific uh, model of reality, uh, if we believe it, has its uh, source in the quantum vacuum, including the existence of our body-mind. That's where we are right now in our attempt to understand reality. This particular model of reality does not explain what we call the mind. Because um, the question then is asked, how do physical objects, in this case molecules and atoms, and force fields, how do molecules, atoms, force fields, electromagnetism, strong weak interactions, gravity, end up with creating a mind, including a human mind that's trying to figure out reality. So at this moment, I hope your mind is engaged in either agreeing with me, disagreeing with me, um, if it is engaged, it's having insights and intuitions and understanding and rationality, or maybe not. But in any case, you have a mind that is um, interpreting this experience, all experience, this experience, this experience, this experience, this experience. So when we start to look at the scientific model, we end up with what is now known in science. Again, don't believe me, look it up. We end up in science with something called the hard problem of consciousness. How do atoms, molecules, force fields end up evolving as this brain? which is made up of those force fields, atoms and molecules. And then how does this brain produce thought and imagination or experience of any kind, any kind? The experience of color, taste, sound, texture, smell, the experience of thoughts, feelings, emotions, imagination, intuition, creativity, insight, inspiration, motivation any experience. How does the dance of molecules create the phenomenon that we call thought? And going beyond that, how do atoms and molecules create any experience? Any experience. So this is called the hard problem of consciousness. If you go on the 
internet again, you look up, type out, what are the 125, 130 open questions in science? And there are many, okay? But the first open question in science is what's the universe made of? And my first uh, part of this course with you was that the universe is made of nothing. But then how does the universe, which is made of nothing, look like this to a human being? And I should tell you, only to a human being, because our experience is very species-specific. I was reading the other day about a butterfly called the Painted Lady. This is a very unusual creature, a painted lady, the butterfly. It uses is its feet for taste. It uses its antenna to experience fragrance. It uses its wings, the flapping of its wings, to experience sound. And it has eyes which have 30,000 lenses to experience smell. What is reality to that butterfly, the painted lady? I can't even remotely imagine. I can guess, but I can't imagine. 30,000 lenses, which means that whatever it's experiencing is a shifting kaleidoscope of colors and forms and smells and tastes and everything else. It's a, it's a banquet of rich experience, totally unavailable to me. I don't have 30,000 lenses to my eyes and my feet cannot tell the taste of strawberry ice cream. And I don't have antenna. So every species, every sentient being is having its own experience. You and I are having a human experience. And we label that experience as mind, body, universe. So let us go into the nature of experience, human experience. But the same principle applies to the experience of any other species of consciousness or any other sentient being or any other biological organism. We have the ability to take raw experience and create concepts and constructs and stories and context and meaning and relationship out of that. So let us go now. Let's for the moment take our attention away from the scientific model, which is a scientific story. Very useful. Without that scientific story, we won't have technology. You won't be listening to this or watching this on your computer or using your phone or even have electricity in your home. So scientific modeling of reality has created the human civilization as of now. But let's take any object and trace it in terms of experience. So I'll pick up an object here. This is a glass of water. This is a hand. That's a sneaker. If anyone can see my sneaker, I don't know, but whatever. And I'm looking out of the window, there's a tree out there. Let's trace this experience that we call a glass of water. Before I can call this a glass of water, it's an experience. Where is that experience happening? For lack of a better word, it's happening in me, in consciousness. Before I can call anything an object, this is an experience, even my own body. That which you call your body is an experience. If you weren't having the experience of your body, you wouldn't know that you have a body. The only reason that you have a body is that you have an experience. So for the next few minutes, instead of calling things objects, let's call them experiences. 
let's call this an experience instead of a glass of water. Let's call this a hand instead of a hand. So what is that experience right now? What is this experience right now? Well, for one thing, it's shape, it's form, it's a certain kind of color, different from this kind of color. It's a sound. It's a smell. Even though everybody says water has no taste, but it does. Because if you didn't taste this as it is, you would say something's wrong. It doesn't taste like water. So everything has a taste, everything has a smell. If this was contaminated with germs, you'd say something's wrong. Okay? So there is a fundamental experience going on right now as you're observing this or you're observing your hand. And what is that experience? It's a combination of sensations. It's a combination of sensations that we call color, that we call form, that we call shape. We call it that, but, you know, I have to call it something. So, this is a sensory experience of color, shape, form, sound, taste, smell, texture. The word glass of water is a human construct or a human story for essentially what is a sensory or perceptual experience. You and I do not experience what we call the physical world. You and I experience our sensory perceptions and we call them physical objects, human constructs. That which you call a physical body is a human construct for a changing, shifting, transforming experiences, experience of sensations, and yeah, essentially sensations, perceptual fluctuations in consciousness. And then we label that as physical objects. Glass of water, hand, eyes, shoes, the earth, the sky, the sun, the stars. Before we can label them as those entities, we have to experience them. And what we experience are perceptual fluctuations in our awareness. So what is a sound? Sound is an activity of awareness as that experience that you and I call sound. Now, we can go down the rabbit hole and call that particular sound Deepak's voice, that particular sound um, the song of a bird, that particular sound, a bell, that particular sound, thunder, but those are interpretations, mental interpretations of perceptual experiences. And what are perceptual experiences? It's our five senses, it's, our percep it's perceptual activities which are known in that which we call awareness, which are experienced in awareness, which occur in awareness, and which then disappear into awareness. Awareness is the silent witnessing entity. Awareness is the silent witnessing entity, which is almost like the screen on a television set that is modulating itself as the experiences that are the shows on the TV program, whatever program you're watching. It's a beautiful metaphor from my friend Rupert Spira. Spira likens awareness to the non-changing screen in which the fluctuations of the screen itself are the colors and the modulations of that screen are the experiences that you call the show. It's a good metaphor. But it's not 
as all metaphors are, it's not 100% accurate because the awareness in which these experiences occur doesn't have a shape, doesn't have a color, doesn't have a form, doesn't have a sound. There's no texture, taste, smell to it. The awareness just is. Having an experience of itself, a sound, taste, smell, texture, form, and then in this case human awareness, a particular species of awareness is interpreting these sounds as phenomena that we call thunder or lightning or a tree or a cloud or a star or a galaxy or a human body. <clears throat> so let's establish our most important point here. Before we can call something an object, it's an experience. The experience occurs in consciousness, known in consciousness, disappears in consciousness and is made out of consciousness. This is a tough part. Sound is a modified form of consciousness. Color is a modified quality of consciousness, as is taste, smell. There's no taste, smell in the absence of consciousness or awareness. So awareness is constantly modifying itself into what we call perceptual experiences. And then awareness, in this case human awareness, is giving labels and definitions and context and meaning and even purpose to these raw experiences, which are perceptual fluctuations of itself. But human awareness is creating, for lack of a better word, a construct, a story, a context to the raw experience that we call perception. And where is awareness doing this? In the same place that awareness is modifying itself into perceptual experience. Now, the next step is a little difficult, but you'll get it. Awareness, which is having the experience, is infinite. Why do I say that? Well, the reason awareness that is having the experience is infinite is that it has no form. If it had a form, if consciousness had a form, then it would be something you can see. Form means an appearance. There's no appearance of form or phenomena other than an awareness in which the form is being experienced. So what we call form, every form that we experience is a phenomenon and every phenomenon is a perceptual and cognitive interpretation in awareness. Awareness is modifying itself into fluctuations called perceptions, other fluctuations that we call thought. What's a thought? Thought is nothing other than the interpretation of perception. And perception is a learned phenomenon. You know, I once read about these little kittens who were brought up in a room that had only horizontal stripes. When they grew up to be cats, they could see only a horizontal world. Another group of kittens brought up in a room that had vertical stripes. And when they grew up, they could see only a vertical world. Is the world vertical or horizontal? It depends on who's looking and what are they using to do the looking. The, the human biological apparatus is the instrument for observation. And every instrument reflects its own version of reality. I just told you about the painted lady, what it is experiencing. What does a snake experience through infrared or a bat through the echo of ultrasound or a chameleon whose eyeballs swivel on two different axes? I can't even remotely imagine again what that experience is. What's the experience of the world to an insect with multiple eyes? Don't know. 
So, is there something called an objective world made up of matter, molecules, atoms, subatomic particles having their source in the quantum vacuum? Are, or are all these human constructs for modes of knowing and experience in human consciousness? using another experience in human consciousness that we call the human biology and the human mind. It's an experience. Is your body the container of awareness or is your body a changing, fluctuating experience in awareness? So if you think you are your body, you have to tell me which one. It's a changing fluctuation of perceptions toddler, baby, etc. Every form is a phenomenon. Every phenomenon is the arising and subsiding of perceptual activity, which is a modified form of consciousness. And the interpretation of that perceptual activity, which is also a modified form of consciousness, because the interpretation is consciousness. So that which we call the mind, body, and the world are nothing but consciousness modifying itself into these experiences which appear as forms and phenomena, but when you trace them down to their source, you end up with consciousness. And since consciousness doesn't have a form, it doesn't have a form. Having no form, it has no location. Having no location, it doesn't exist in time or in space. Formless, timeless, spaceless, in a way inconceivable, because everything we conceive, conceive, imagine, everything we conceive, imagine, is based on experiences in space-time. If reality is outside space-time, it's inconceivable, at least as far as the human thought process is concerned. And yet, without this formless being that you are, there would be no experience of form or phenomenon. The great Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore once said, In this playhouse of infinite forms, I caught sight of the formless. And so, my life was blessed. Here's the conclusion. Existence has two versions. One is that which has form. This is existence with form. And then the existence has another version, which is totally formless. And being formless, it is infinite. You, as awareness, are an infinite consciousness having finite experiences. The experiences are ungraspable because they are fluctuations of consciousness. And fluctuations, by definition, come and go. Therefore, are experienced in what we call a time-bound reality. But that which is experiencing this reality in form and phenomenon of course, it's its own finite expressions. Insight. Insight is, you are a formless being having an experience of form and phenomena. You are an infinite being having the experience of that which we call the finite. But the finite is a fluctuation of your infinite being and being a fluctuation, it is ungrasped which means you cannot grasp a movement, an activity. So earlier on we were talking about dreams and in fact this, this whole program is about spontaneous manifestation of dreams or desires or intentions. That which we usually call a dream is based on our experiences at night when we go to sleep. So when you go to sleep, you go through two phases. One is deep sleep, when all fluctuations of consciousness die down. 
And there is only awareness without experience. And what is awareness? The potential for experience. That's deep sleep, which has huge significance, but we'll let that go for a moment. And then you also experience a dream state every night. Whether you remember the dream or not, it's still an experience you have. You usually dismiss it in the morning. You say it was just a dream, meaning it was not real. And the reason it's not real is that when you look back at the dream, it's not here. It's over. So a dream, by definition, is transient. It's evanescent. It's ephemeral. It's ungraspable. And it is uncatchable. Even if you learn to lucid dream and be a witness of the dreams, you'll see the dream is a shifting fluctuation of sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts. But then in the morning we wake up and we say, that was a dream, by implying that was an illusion. And then we wake up to this reality and we say, this is real. But examine this reality a little more carefully. If I asked you, what happened to your childhood? Think about it. Evoke the memories and the experiences of childhood. You see something, you experience something. It's very dreamlike, right? I mean, thinking of your childhood right now is like a dream. Think of yesterday. Think of what you ate for dinner last night. It's a dream. Think of what you did this morning before you dressed up and went to work or before you were watching this program. It's a dream. If I asked you what happened five minutes ago, think about it. It's a dream. If I asked you what happened a minute ago, it's a dream. If I asked you what happened a second ago, it's a dream. The past is a dream, the future is a dream, and the present changes before you can catch it. Even my words, by the time you hear them, they don't exist anymore. By the time you hear me and see me, that which you hear and see is already in the past. So the past is a dream, the future is a dream. And the present is a lucid dream in what we call a vivid now, but we call it real. If you really examine this, it's nothing other than a lucid dream, an incessant, ceaseless activity of consciousness modifying itself as sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts. That's it. The rest is a human story called body, mind, and universe, objects, things, form, phenomena. Trace back any experience, whether it's color or form, and I ask you, is there a color in the absence of seeing? It's a ridiculous thing. No, there's no color in the absence of seeing. This color is not a property of, the, of what we call the physical world. Even science models would say that which you see is color, is invisible photons that are causing electrical currents to go to your brain. The brain is producing chemistry. You're experiencing color. That's true of sound. That's true of any experience. Ultimately, it's all electrical currents going into the brain producing chemical reactions that we call the physical world and also interpretation that we call the mental world. But if you start to trace back every experience, color, sound, taste, smell, texture, thought, feeling, emotion, imagination, you'll see all these experiences are 
fluctuations of consciousness as sensations, images, feelings, thoughts, period. You are generating them, you are experiencing them, and these experiences are made out of you. And you is an infinite, formless consciousness, which is not in space-time, and it's curving back within itself and creating again and again. If you read the Upanishads, one of the best Upanishads, these are teachings from ancient wisdom traditions in the East. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, curving back within myself, I create again and again. Prakratim swam vashtabhai, vishrajami puna puna, in Sanskrit. Curving back within myself, I create again and again. I create the experience that I call mind. I create the experience that I call body. I create the experience of that which I call the world. And who is this I? It's a formless, borderless, infinite dimensionless, or you can say infinite dimensions, eternal, timeless being, modifying itself into species-specific experiences. We are a particular species of consciousness. There are innumerable species of consciousness. Octopus, what is the experience of the world to an octopus? So there's no world, there are only experiences which are being generated as species-specific experiences which are transient, ephemeral, just like the dream. That's why Wittgenstein, the great German philosopher, he said, we are asleep, our life is a dream, but once in a while we wake up enough to know that we are dreaming. A lucid dream, a not-so-lucid dream, and then ultimately a consciousness that is totally unimaginable, inconceivable, timeless, formless, eternal, finite, infinite, having this dream in the theater of space-time and causality. The Buddha said the same thing. He said, this lifetime of ours is transient as autumn clouds. To watch the birth and death of beings is like looking at the movements of a dance, a lifetime is like a flash of lightning in the sky, rushing by like a torrent down a steep mountain. That's all part of the dream. Rumi, look at your eyes, they are so small, but they see enormous things. I am so small, how do I fathom the entire universe? But you're not small, you're infinite. Okay, small implies a location in space-time, maybe a dot, okay, something that is an experience, but infinite. And you cannot be bound by your finite creations. So even if you start asking yourself, when you look at objects, you say, what is happening that experience? Where is that experience occurring? And you trace it back to its source, you'll end up with being, timeless being. You are the creator of the universe and actually you are the creator of the human universe. The ultimate creator, which is another aspect of infinity, is creators of all universes in all dimensions of space-time as all species-specific experiences. The complexity is such that if it, there was a word for God, it would be trickster. If you can see it, if you can touch it, if you can taste it, if you can smell it, if you can think about it, if you can imagine it, if you can conceptualize it, if you can experience it as any form of phenomenon, it's a transient dream occurring in you. You are the dreamer and you're not the dream. You are the seer you're not the scenery. You are the observer and not that which is observed, which is a fluctuation of your own self. You are the knower, not that which is known, which is a human construct for an experience of your own self as that, as that, as that. So this is the next step. Are molecules real? Molecules are human constructs 
for a mode of knowing and experience in human consciousness. We made them up. Molecules are magical lies. Are atoms real? They are human constructs for modes of knowing and experience in human consciousness. Are particles real? They are human constructs for modes of knowing and experience in something that we created called a Hadron Collider. Are atoms, molecules, subatomic particles, virtual reality, or quantum vacuum, are these real entities? I would say, no, they are human constructs for modes of knowing and experience and interpretation in human consciousness, which is modifying itself as body, mind, and the universe, and then taking that construct and taking it further down the rabbit hole. This is matter. It's a thing out there, not an experience in here. It's made of molecules, atoms. You see, every bit of matter broken down to smaller pieces of matter and ultimately disappearing into nothing, it ends up in the same place. You are the infinite formless being creating the experience of body, mind and universe. And if you get back to that source, which is creating all these experiences, and if you know that you're consciously constructing the world in every experience, in every perceptual experience, you're consciously constructing the world, and that actually there's a way to deconstruct it and then resurrect it as another experience, then we spontaneously fulfill one dream and turn it into another dream. We are shapeshifters. We are cosmic alchemists that are turning ourselves into innumerable modes of experience, innumerable objects, innumerable phenomena, innumerable modes of knowing, all in the one self, which is you, which is me. Where is it? it has no location in space-time. It's the wrong question. Where implies a location in space and existence in time for something which is non-local. So that's why spiritual traditions say, I am a spiritual being having a human experience. I am a non-local being having a human experience. I am an invisible being having a visible experience of my invisible of my invisibility. You are the creator. But you are an unconscious creator. So let's say you pick up a strawberry and first of all, remember that that which you call a strawberry is a human concept. No other species, including other species, that eat strawberries know it's called a strawberry. Other species that we give names to, dolphins, snakes, alligators, birds, they don't know that they're called those entities. Those are human constructs for human knowing, human experience. So I hope you've been patient enough to follow where I'm getting, following every experience to a source, ending up with pure awareness, which has the qualities that are very similar to the quantum vacuum that I mentioned. You know, source of all. But quantum vacuum is a construct. You have to experience pure consciousness in order to manifest. And pure consciousness is the dimensionless being that you are. Every object is an experience. Every object is a perceptual activity. Every perceptual activity is in a witnessing awareness that is observing that perceptual activity. What we call the mind is an interpretation of that activity. What we call physical reality is also an interpretation of that perceptual activity. Mind, body, universe are fluctuations of your own being, which is timeless, 
formless, eternal, dimensionless, not in space-time, and is the observer in every perception, is the observer in every thought, in every feeling, in every sensation, in every bit of imagination. You are embedded as the awareness, the observer, the witnessing awareness in which that experience is happening. That witnessing awareness is you as infinite being. So let's stop there before we get to the next adventure down the rabbit hole. Hey, thanks for watching. If you liked this Commune Masterclass, then I think you'll love this video right here. It's kind of like the universe is a GPS. And when you make a mistake or someone else makes a mistake, it automatically recalibrates. There's always a road back to that which would be perfect.